All right. So um, I'm going on trip next week. May not have good access to internet, so I'm putting this one out here um, a bit early just to make sure there aren't any any issues. What we're going to be talking about though is investing in stocks and also um, bonds. Um, again, I can show you uh, how the book talks about stocks and stuff. I, I think stocks are you know pretty exciting in terms of investment. Certainly can be profitable if you uh, you know figure it out. Um, Anyway, for most of you, you'll you'll probably end up being invested in mutual funds, which typically they, they don't have to be composed, you know, exclusively of stocks, but generally are probably a safer um, bet, uh, less headache for you. You know, there's a, a mutual fund manager whose job it is to, uh, you know, select the stocks and you select the mutual fund. You read the prospectus, you, you know, sort of decide um what what kind of stocks what kind of things you want to be interested in and you pick that fund that's got a manager that's you know associated with it and then they kind of take off and and do their thing and you know you just check back in on it periodically um stocks are a little bit more involved although you know buying and selling stuff really quickly is uh um not generally you know long-term type thing and and probably not advisable in terms of generating short-term capital gains which are uh um you know taxed at a higher rate the commissions though are basically non-existent now um everything is as because electronic trading and uh the research available to you through the internet um that's all good so there, there's ups and downs but Anyway, the importance of knowing about stocks, though, is the fact that even though you may not be interested in buying, you know, shares directly, it's important that you kind of understand it. So when your mutual fund performs a certain way, you, you know, have an idea of, of the underlying uh, assets that are making it move that direction. So stock exchanges mentioned this a little bit before, you know, these are like the secondary markets. So again, you know, buying directly from a company is is pretty rare. Um, you may, like I say, I, I've done that where uh, you get it at a discount, but typically, uh, most you know, most of the firms you're probably going to be interested in are, are not available that way. You're going to be buying through a stock exchange. New York Stock Exchange is kind of prestigious, but uh, this whole business of floor traders and people yelling and stuff, most of it's all digital now. There are places, you know, because of the electronic trading, um, you know, people pay massive sums of money to be closer to the exchange, even though the, you know, speed of electricity is the same as speed of light. They they still, if they're doing that electronic trading and, and uh, you know, automated trading, it, it does make a bit of a difference for them. So um, people may still want to be located near that exchange, but obviously when we're talking those kind of speeds there's not a human involved directly the human wrote the algorithm but then they you know stand back and let it run so specialists so uh, the reason why a market is important is because you know that there's you want a market you you want when things are dropping um, if there wasn't somebody speculating somebody out there trying to swoop in like a vulture and pick it off when it's a good deal uh things would just continue to fall you know that's how markets fall apart when there's nobody there trying to you know make a bit of money on it and uh so yeah you know in a any any system that doesn't revolve around profit is semi doomed to failure you know as they've said you know the capitalism whatever or system other than everything else. I mean, um, anyway, but but that's why markets exist is is to uh, provide the fluidity and and bring buyers and sellers together and and keep prices uh, you know normalized. If if there were only a few players in there, you'd have huge swings. Um, and so it's better to have a, a huge market with lots of people looking at it. Other stock exchanges. Yeah, American Stock Exchange, Regional Stock Exchange, but these things don't need to exist as a physical thing. So this OTC over the counter, you know, like NASDAQ, 
Um, NASDAQ's just a acronym about whatever no sh national something stock. Anyway, it's 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 just a a virtual exchange, which is where you know a lot of those high tech companies start, and sometimes they stay there. There there is some prestige to moving to the you know the big board to the to the uh, New York Stock Exchange, but I don't know about that so much anymore because there's just so much volume that's done on on Nasdaq. All the you know the companies you want. Um, they may have migrated over to New York, but a lot of them are still still traded on on the over the counter Nasdaq kind of stuff. This uh, notion of the trading day, I've I've seen some after hours trading. It's usually pretty limited, and and sometimes too you you need to be a little careful, like trading on holidays and things like that. You'll see big swings with prices, but when you realize, getting back to what I was talking about, very few people are in the market. Let's say you're selling a stock, you know, nearing Christmas Day, and um, all of a sudden the, the, you know, there's no market for it except for one guy. And anyway, that you'll see some some um, price swings, and you'll see a drop in uh, volume around those holidays. So anyway, um, price quotation. So stock brokers, I've, I've been put it lightly screwed by those guys numerous times uh, just about uh, this was back you know again this was a long time ago I was overseas primarily in the Middle East you know doing military stuff and so I had uh, a broker and and I switched brokers a couple times well the, the chain of events was generally they'd recommend some stock I'd buy that stock I'd lose a little bit of money and then I'd get a letter in the mail from you know, a bunch of other investors initiating a class action lawsuit against that brokerage for pushing crap that they had an interest in. And it was just, it was just scammy. And trades, I think it was like 60, 70 bucks a trade. Now it's nothing. I mean, literally nothing. I will show you because it's done electronically. So these guys, they, they never really earn their worth. I, I was looking for a job at one point before I got in the military and I talked to a stock exchange or stock broker about working for them and the, all their questions were do you play golf you know are you in a tennis club it was all about selling stuff to other folks there was no financial knowledge it was just pure sales cold call how many of your friends can you drag into this so anyway not a big fan uh so anyway the internet again i love the way they you know say the internet anyway that that is where you're going to get a financial newspapers if you're trading off newspapers that information's old uh, most financial newspapers that are still exist don't even really print that stuff for the most part because it's of no value so they, they've got to you know do value added some other way um but anyway all that information is still valid but it's just so much more powerful in a in an interactive graph than you know some silly quotation so i'll be referencing some things on the internet here so this is what they're showing you know okay this newspaper here this is what price opened a low oh this is over 52 weeks over a year you know yield that's because it's paying a, a dividend price to earning ratio volume in reference to what you know <laughs> tabular data is just useless like that closed at 50 bucks net change was uh 27 cents so let me show you something i'll step out here and get to the internet okay so here we go with a stock so again back to one of my favorite shopify see on this interactive chart all that information is there but this is the powerful stuff here's one day two days five days a month three months six months a year so now when you want to know what's happening you know you click on this and it should open up to a bigger chart even this may not be the most powerful charting thing uh, let me find a better one for you so believe it or not i don't use yahoo i used to have yahoo mail a long time ago but yahoo finance is still pretty good for charting and what i'm looking for is a um well, let's look at tesla stock i used to have some tesla 
So this is what I'm talking about. This is the kind of interactivity I like, you know. Oh, something happened back here. When did that happen, you know? Well, it happened. Oh, that's over a day. Okay. Not so interesting. Man, it zoomed. I, I did own some back in this range. So, yeah. Blind squirrel, I didn't quite find that nut. But anyway, it, it, just a lot more information. Max would be the life of the company, right? So it did an IPO probably. Five bucks way back when, and then started just meandering around, and then good things happen, right? Something bad happened here, but we're not talking huge volume. And it's all time high was 498, and it's down to 420. Oh no, 617. Anyway, and here's the volume too. This is interesting. So now when they say, oh, it did so many units of volume. Uh, you know, you'd have to know exactly what it did yesterday, the day before. Here's this volume running right across the bottom. So just a lot more information, a lot more current. Um, sometimes you have to pay, pardon me, pay for instant quotes or whatever. Sometimes they're delayed by a few seconds and you can get them for free, you know, 15 seconds or something. But anyway, so it makes what these guys are talking about completely obsolete. Uh, buying, selling stocks, selecting a broker. You know, you select a company. So maybe overly optimistic, certainly will be because they're salespeople. Must disclose. Yeah, they should, shouldn't they? Uh, anyway, information available on internet. Brokerage commissions. So again, they can be quite expensive. Placing an order, number of shares, odd lots. You know, they're making a big deal if you don't sell in, in even lots. Market limits and stop. Okay, so I'm going to talk more about that, but let me show you something again. Back to the internet. Here's a couple different companies that you might work with. Fidelity, straightforward pricing, zero expense ranges, uh, whatever. They're going to charge you uh, zero commissions on stock purchases, on ETFs. Vanguard. Low trading fees, zero trading fees, um, TD Ameritrade, you know, no data feeds, no trade minutes. So none of that 100, you know, zero dollar commissions. And all that information you were talking about, you know, in terms of research, you've got all kinds of research available to you. And we're not even logged on. This is not I do have an account with these folks, but I'm not logged on here. But, you know, Morningstar, the people who do mutual funds, Thompson Reuters has some news. But anyway, you can go in here and you can, you know, get a lot more information. And if you think, you know, whatever, you, you got, you know, a thousand bucks or whatever, and you're going to get some great attention from your broker. Mm, he's looking at the high net worth individuals, you know, because he gets a, a little portion of that that income. So especially when you're starting out, you kind of have to, uh, you know, be your own person. One other thing I'll show you right now too, is I pay for a subscription service and this is actually, I am logged in here. I've got a few services I use with these guys, but anyway, just Motley Fool, nothing special. You could buy this for, I don't know, hundred, 200, um, for a year, but they'll come out with these picks, you know, and they've got different ones. They've got more conservative ones, but rule breakers is kind of a up and coming thing. And again, I'm not, you know, recommending any of these, but I'm just showing you that um, you can't get advice. It's not just a, uh, you know, crap shoot or something, but tell you the truth. I don't typically buy things in here unless it's something, you know, that I see real value in. Like if you've ever tried to do documents, you know, facts and stuff or doing that DocuSign is really pretty darn good and so you know i i kind of believe in them so i i have a little bit of their their stock but anyway i want to read down here in their you know financials and they'll they'll tell me a little about what they think and and stocks are priced on their future right you know just because they had a great year last year uh their price may be up and that may be reflecting the stock price but where I'm going to make my money is by this price going up. So, and then if I wanted to buy DocuSign, <coughs> pardon me, it would be uh, link me up with a, a broker. So let's just do one last one and then we'll get back into the book here. 
So DocuSign, let's see. Um, that's a day, so don't get scared off. One day. So you see all that red, you go, oh, that doesn't look like something I'm interested in. Yeah, this kind of looks like something I'm interested in. But see how all this stuff in the past, whatever, COVID has, uh, how long has COVID been going now? Anyway, um, year to date, it, nothing's really going to be tearing it up until people get back to work. So that's just something you got to factor in. Not going to forecast on the election, but everything's going to do real. I, I don't think it's going to have a huge impact. There's this fallacy that people think, oh, you know, the Republicans control the stock market. The Republicans are the money people. Not even the uh, big Wall Street folks, the, you know, the Googles, the Amazon, the <laughs> whatever. I mean, what's his name? Bezos owns the Washington Post. If you think he's conservative, um, you know. Your, anyway, so um, long term, it may be negative if it goes one way or another. I'm not going to, you know, politicize here. But um, um, if if we have a closer relationship with China, there may be some some short term gains, but maybe not in the long term. But that's all I'm going to say. OK, so let's say you decide you want to buy in the stock market. There's easy, easy ways to to do this. You. You pick one of those companies, you know, and there's a whole range of them, but probably about eight, ten big ones. You know, say you get TD Ameritrade or Fidelity or or whoever, whoever you you choose, and they're typically a full service kind of firm that not only could could be you know brokerage, but perhaps also what I do, and when I'm talking about emergency fund, I t keep it in in a brokerage like that because it's you know it's not something I write checks on. Uh, low, low incidence of identity theft and the rest of it. So anyway, um, I've got some money in an account there. And if for most of you, you'll probably be doing mutual funds. So um, you won't go through this process. Mutual funds, you you could say, hey, I want to sign up and I want to uh, have you take, you know, 10% of my income. You know, you set some dollar figure and just set up an automatic debit with those guys and you know, the whole pay yourself first and off you go. And, you know, it's kind of an autopilot and your your hands off. The other way you could do it is if you wanted to buy individual stocks, you would first want to uh, get some cash to them. So, again, you could do this automatic deposit, but rather than going to a mutual fund, just put it into a, a money market account or some sort of cash brokerage account and then do your research and decide what stock you want to buy. Now, let's say you're watching a stock and you see it kind of going up and down. And, you know, this is all about buying high, selling low. Now, if you've been watching it and you see, wow, it's really low today. I think I'm going to jump on it. Then maybe you want to jump on it. You would do a market order. OK. And that just means you're buying now. OK. So this is the one that I'd be a little careful executing, you know, maybe right around Christmas or some big holiday because, the market may not be in, in good form, but yeah, anyway. Um, you also have an option of doing a limit order. And a limit order means, you know, this this whole thing, you, you got a life to live. You're watching the stock and it's going from, you know, 30 to 35 bucks and you see it keep going. And right now it's at 35 and you're going, you know, next time it gets down to, to 30 bucks, I want to buy it. And so you put in a limit order and you specify that, you know, buy X numbers of shares at $30 and, you know, put it good till canceled or put it good till the end of the day or whatever limits you want. That'll be a, a facet there on the uh, on the drop down menu and you set that order. And if that price drops down to that price, your limit order now becomes a market order and and boom, you're you're in the game. The same can be true. Um, with uh, a sell order you can you know it's crept up it's hitting almost 50 bucks but not quite there me personally i would sell at you know 49 something um, a lot of times there's psychological barriers where you know when they get to round numbers and you'll see a stock price hover and maybe never quite cross the finish line so a lot of times i'd set that you know sell order 
you know, $49.80 or something if I wanted 50, because I, I know that it's, there's going to be some hesitancy getting over that final line. But anyway, that's just psychology. Um, but anyway, you could do that and boom, if, if it gets to $49.80, your limit order became a, a market order. So the other thing you can do, and this is, you know, what this related to the stop order. And I did this, for example, with with Twitter years ago. Twitter was trading in this range. It was super volatile and, and none of the market analysts could figure out what it was worth. So they were kind of staring clear of it. And and so the big money was wasn't really in Twitter because they really didn't have any, you know, brick and mortar assets. And so people just really had a tough time uh, evaluating it. So it was going from 30 to 50 bucks. And I just saw it just keep bouncing back and forth between those limits. So, you know, there's money to be made in that volatility. So I just started doing that. And I'd put in a, a buy order for 30. And then, you know, once that executed, I put in a sell order for 50. And, uh, you know, I don't know, a week, a month, whatever later, I get a note on my phone that it's sold. And then I'd put in that buy order for 30 and then you know when it when it dropped back down again and and anyway just it was fairly predictable in that way this is all speculation though. this is probably not what you should be doing with your retirement buddy but anyway that being said uh when, when you see those sort of order options uh those are kind of some of the things you can do you can also do this is one last thing i'll just talk about it's called a trailing stop and this is kind of cool where Let's say we're trading Twitter again, and it's it's going, you know, creeping up towards 50, and you're, you're kind of greedy. You're like, you know, I'd be happy with 50, but I, if it keeps going, I don't want to be left out. So you can put a trailing stop, which means um, rather than sell at 50, let's say it's 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 blown through, you know, 45 or something like that. Um, you can you can let's say it's at 48 now. You can put a, a trailing stop at, say, 45. And, and if it keeps going on this upward trajectory, uh, your trailing stop's not going to execute. And let's say now it gets up to 50. Now you move your trailing stop up to 48. And let's say it goes up to, you know, 55. And you put your trailing stop at 52. And that you just keep inching that trailing stop right behind um, your order. And if there's, for some reason, that... that stock price drops through that through that floor um you know your your order will be executed and you'll sell it say 52 in this case and hey you made two extra bucks by uh having that trailing stop and and letting it um you know exceed where you thought it was going to go so anyway a lot of stuff you can do and it's all available to on any of these accounts it's it's not a big deal um more stuff yeah so it can be defined differently buy stop order when stop prices rises sell stop order so yeah the trailing stop is the one that kind of inches along you may have to do that manually or there may be some sort of mechanism you just have to check with your brokerage but place an order online low commission yes zero is very low buying a stock on margin pretty much don't do this you know, buying real estate on margin, buying using borrowed money is what they're talking about. That's all good. But like I say, the problem with buying a stock on margin is that the collateral for your loan is the stock. And so let's say you buy $10,000 or buy $10,000 worth of stock and um, you buy it on credit. But in order to do that, um, you know, you, you take a loan. But the, the margin requirements are such that you have to put down five thousand bucks so you basically have to have half of it in cash um which is all good until the stock price happens to drop well you still owe these folks you know that five grand you still have that that loan out there and now your collateral if the stock price has dropped your collateral is dropped so they want you to buy more stock or come up with more money to meet that margin requirement and so anyway, that's where you get this margin call. And anyway, bring it back up to the minimum level or they will sell your stock. That's not good. Short selling. I don't know why they get into this. I mean, I've done this before and that's what I did with Tesla. Um, 
short selling this this is definitely getting the speculation it's way into speculation what you do is you you sell something um, basically you don't own right so what I did was I sold some Tesla stock and let's say it was trading for a hundred bucks I think it was actually trading for about 80 or something but I sold Tesla stock and I didn't own that stock and my impression was that the stock price was going to fall um, because of just the, the situation uh, there's a political event that was coming up and Tesla was very reliant on subsidies and they weren't really killing it right then and so maybe they do well in the long run but in the short run their stock price was going to drop and so um, I sold those shares for say uh, $100 but again I didn't have to pay for them uh, till uh, a certain point in the future and um, by that time the stock price had dropped to it dropped about 10 bucks 15 bucks I mean I was correct and uh, you know I, I made um, some money because I was able to when I had to buy those shares eventually since I you know I actually since I sold shares I didn't have when I actually had to buy those shares later they were at a cheaper price so anyway it gets kind of confusing um, you can also do options and futures um, options are fun you know options are a right but not a responsibility to to execute a, a particular transaction um, but futures futures are futures contracts and man you can get in a heap of trouble and uh, I would definitely not recommend doing futures contracts but there are investments that are out there uh, just so w what would happen on let's say a futures contract futures are normally done on commodities let's say you're an airline and you buy you know jet fuel and jet fuel fuel prices go up and down and you want to sell tickets way in advance you know right now if you went online to buy tickets for not this Thanksgiving but next Thanksgiving you probably could and you know the, let's say the price is whatever you know four hundred dollars to go somewhere and for an airline from one year out to be able to set their prices with all those variables especially fuel that how can they do that how can they set their prices well what they would typically do is they would um, sell a futures contract for fuel so let's say you know they um, want to know what the fuel is going to cost them they need to know what the fuel is going to cost them a year out from now they'll go to maybe Chicago Board of Trade something like that one of the big commodities traders and they'll buy um, you know one million gallons of jet fuel at a certain price for delivery in you know November 2021 and let's say jet fuel goes for four bucks a gallon they'll they'll put out a contract paying you know four dollars and 25 cents you know some sort of premium and some speculator out there some investor the guy on the other side of the trade is going to go you know what I think prices are going to stay stable maybe drop I'll take that and anyway so when um, November 2020 rolls around the guy who took that contract now needs to deliver that jet fuel that million gallons at four dollars and 25 cents now most of the time this guy's a speculator he's going to sell this contract to somebody else it's going to change hands a you know a certain number of times but ultimately you know somebody somebody's going to be going to some energy company and and finalizing this transaction that futures contract is going to happen it's a contract and if jet fuel is you know four bucks a gallon still you know somebody's gonna make some money but if there was a problem and it shot up to five bucks tough luck that guy's gonna lose money and you know lose whatever 75 cents times a million 
So 750 grand, whatever, a lot of money's going to lose. So anyway, that's how futures contracts work. And that's why they're out there is because a lot of industries need that price stability with commodities. And so they'll do that. And uh, but the safer bet for me, if I was going to get involved in something like that, would be an option. And an option is kind of like an insurance policy. And you you buy an option and you you do all those same you know specifics for you know delivery of jet fuel but you have the right but not the obligation so if it works out in your favor you can execute it um, if it doesn't work out in your favor you just let the option expire worthless you never finalize it so anyway a lot more to that stuff i, I probably went deeper than i wanted to already but um you know they they kind of mentioned it and so i'll leave it at that analyzing stocks Different people will use different methods. Um, technical analysis. Some guys will, will really get into to charts and you know just go off and not really look at markets and and the rest of the economy. And they'll 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 have these you know charting patterns. And when they see a certain pattern develop, they'll they'll jump on it. Um, I'm not a big fan of that. I'm more of a fundamental analysis guy, you know, not so much revenue earnings, but I want to know what, you know, the company, uh, what their future's like, what are their products reasonable, you know, um, there's the Oracle of Omaha guy, you know, Warren Buffett, fairly famous, he's done quite well, Berkshire Hathaway and all that, it, you know, he, he kind of has a philosophy that, he wants something and that he can basically reach out and touch, you know, and, and he's made some very smart maneuvers and he, and he's, you know, he's based in Omaha. So he, he owns a lot of down to earth stuff. Like if you buy any kind of cowboy boot, it's pretty much a Warren Buffett product. You know, he owns Tony Lama, he owns Justin, he owns things like that. And also he, he does some sort of sneaky stuff. Like he's uh, one of these guys who is very much against the oil pipelines. Why? Because he bought the railroad. That oil's got to be, you know, if they don't have a pipeline, it's got to go on his CSX trains. So, you know, uh, anyway, definitely a capitalist. And uh, But he's he's very successful in his investing. And uh, he would be more of a fundamentals kind of guy. Financial conditions. So if you are going into this field, this class is, you know, not going to provide you that background. This really is getting down in the weeds. But, you know, with um, some of the research that's offered um, on, on some of the websites of the brokerage firms, um, with some of the items that might be specified, you know, by a, a stock recommendation service like, you know, Molly Fool or somebody like that, maybe you can make sense of it. Um, but uh, you need sort of a comparison and you need to know you know a little about the industry these most of these analysts they don't cover all stocks they they know their segment and they know it well and uh anyway i i don't really um think you have a competitive advantage um being up here in alaska trying to out analyze somebody back in new york who's got a a research staff i don't want to i want to be in uh, situations where I'm not betting against those folks. So, impact firm performance. So this is a no-brainer. You know, investors are confident. So it's always they're always forward-looking, right? You're you're you know you want to see a company that's got a strong track record, but you know if if their stock is sort of played out, you know, let's say they're like Crocs, you know. I guess there's still people who wear those things, but there was probably a certain t time and place where, you know, those things exploded in terms of a, uh, some sort of stock. But you, you had to know that the future, and again, maybe I don't know much about the company, but in a lot of consumer goods, things kind of play out. Whereas, you know, sometimes companies get a second win. I, I remember when Apple was, they were almost giving up on them many times. And it's, uh, Premier, I probably should have bought more Tesla and held on to it. But, you know, trying to pick winners and losers is difficult. And uh, anyway, 
there was a funny thing about how it's much easier to pick losers. And really, uh, you know, nine out of 10 startups fail. So uh, picking losers, the odds are with you. Um, but anyway, that's why when I'm picking a stock, I generally look, you know, I look for three things. I, I look for, um, you know, recommendation from one of the companies that I follow. Um, it's got to make sense to me in terms of market. That's number two. And then number three, if I'm serious about it, I'll, I'll, I'll look at the financial and, and get some comparison data, but it, it can be hard to do. Um, yeah, accounting fraud. Certainly. Trying to guess is is very, very difficult. But, you know, you, you do have the ability if, if you don't think, you know, the U.S. is, is um, going to be dominant in that you, you can go to another another um, country. You can invest in. Well, if you invest in, like, say, international mutual funds, that would be everything except for the U.S. If you invest in global, it can be everything to include the U.S. But anyway. Uh, GDP, physical policy, anyway, the impact of international economies. With globalism, and it does exist, I mean, you know, there's a saying that when the, you know, whatever, the U.S. sneezes, uh, the rest of the world gets a cold, or we sneeze and they get a cold. Anyway, it's, uh, economies are so interlinked that it's it's very hard to find a uh, another country that's not going to be affected by the others if there's a you know stock plummets in one country it's probably going to be accompanied by a, a decline worldwide interest rates interest rates are definitely very low right now some stocks more sensitive than others you know when interest rates are low Companies can expand faster because it's cheaper to, to basically rent money, to borrow money. Federal Reserve is always trying to, you know, m maneuver the Fed, trying to set interest rates, control inflation. Um, but inflation has pretty much been non-existent lately. Uh, there was a bunch of, uh, you know, pumping money, quantitative easing did definitely affect the uh, stock prices kind of artificially inflated them, but uh, and that still happens. They're, they're still trying to compensate for the COVID situation as well. Inflation almost non-existent right now, but typically, you know, should be about three percent, and that definitely eats into any profits. In fact, we've had very low inflation for a while is a is a good thing. Industry indicators, integrating your analysis. So again, you know, I even, I mean, I've watched stocks for a long time, but I, when I pick one independently, uh, I've got a few losers out there that I'd rather not dwell on. And uh, most of my good picks are things that, you know, made sense. And again, if you're not really interested in doing this as sort of a hobby, then Mutual funds are probably a better a better way for you to to go because that way you you turn that management responsibility that stock picking over to somebody else. So stock prices go up, stock prices go down. And though you know when we look at mutual funds, you'll see that you know stocks in a sector will often go up and down. Uh, together so um, there's certain sectors that don't have aren't known for high growth I've always tend to jump into uh, uh, high-tech things and I've always seemed to get burned in medical stocks anytime I've done anything in the medical sector and the defense sector is very sluggish in my mind but anyway limitations to stock analysis difficulty in future conditions and so a lot of this too when you're looking at stock prices and mutual fund prices there, there's this concept of market timing trying to guess you know when there's going to be 
a big event that's going to cause volatility and it's very hard most people who try it almost everybody who tries it is is typically unsuccessful um there's going to be a podcast where we're going to uh it's a it's actually broadcast on npr but it was a it was about a bet that was held a number of years ago and what they did was they had uh, one individual picking a lot of stocks and um, you know actively managing an account and then the other was just a person who just bought a, a stock indice and that was in the mutual fund sector i'll probably save it till next week for the mutual funds i don't know i i may put it out there because it's a little bit more in depth it'll make more sense as we go into mutual funds but they will in the process of that podcast will probably provide a better example of um, indices than I can do uh, just off the cuff investing in bonds so bonds are again it's a it's a loan all the stocks we talked about stocks are an equity position you own a piece of the company bonds are just a company a corporation or a government agency um, rather than go to a bank They'll, they'll probably be a bank involved in the offering, but the bank's not sitting on a you know a stack of cash. They will generally they'll do a bond offering. They'll be an intermediary, intermediary and offer a a uh, bond for sale to the public. So par value is the face value. So when I say like a twenty thousand dollar bond, that would be that face value. Most bonds ten to thirty years. And again, the notion is that um, you give them this money, you know, for 10 to 30 years, and um, that at the par value, you give them like say the 20 grand, and they keep it for 10 to 30 years, and then they pay you um, payments, and they pay them, you know, uh, interest payments, and then the par value at the end of the period. Call feature, so. What what happens here with bonds? Let's say a bond is you know pays a, a three percent interest rate. Why does it pay three percent? Well, because that's what the market will bear. You know, if they could get by and only pay you two percent, they certainly would. But for some reason, they have to pay you three percent, and that's based upon um, what analysis think it's worth. Let's say the bond's paying eight percent or 15%, you know, that probably would be rated a, a high yield bond, if they want to call it that, or the synonymous term for that is a junk bond, a bond that's has a high propensity of failure. If that company, you know, is, is a little flaky and they go out of business and they don't pay your money back, um, that's why they're having to pay you 15% because you're, you're accepting quite a bit of risk. So the, the risk is you know based upon um is it generates the the primary part of the interest rate another factor is what the competition is offering so you know if, if somebody else with a similar risk profile and they're offering five percent well then everybody's going to jump and get the five percent bond um so anyway it's it's a that's the good thing about a market again it's you know the markets are fluid and you've got a lot of people involved and and so things tend to get to their true true value now other interest rates such as those affected by the fed and the economy interest rates will change and bank rates will change and so let's say they were only paying five percent last year for their bond offerings now in the new bond offerings they have to have offer six percent to get people to you know give them money and what can happen is um you know the value of your bond in the secondary market will be affected by that because nobody wants to buy your bond that only pays five percent or pays yeah you five know, percent when when they can buy a brand new bond that pays six percent the same is also true if uh, interest rates go down. Um, your bond that's at 5%, if now all of a sudden they're offering 
bonds and they're only paying 3%, all of a sudden your bond is more desirable. And so, you know, your $20,000 bond may be worth 22000 if you wanted to sell it. And so you might want to sell it or you might want to keep, keep getting that uh, higher interest rate. So anyway, now there is a thing and that's where I'm explaining all this is because the call feature and what that means is that let's say you're the bank, the company that issued this bond and you've got these outstanding bonds and you basically got a contract with these people, um, with the with the people who bought the bond um, to you know keep it for 20 years and pay them 5% every year. But if there's a call feature, they can basically cancel that contract. So if, if you've got this bond that's earning 5% and now all of a sudden um, interest rates are down and they can sell that bond they can, or they can you know issue new bonds and only have to pay 3%, well, they're going to call your bond. They're basically going to cancel uh, your bond. They're going to give you your 20 grand back and they're going to sell another bond to somebody else and only pay them 3%. So a call feature does not help you out is, is, the, is the point I'm trying to make. Um, convertible bond. So this one could be converted back into shares. So I don't own any bonds right now. I have had them in the past. Back when inflation was high, I had short-term bonds that were paying 8%, and that was kind of nice. But nobody's doing that now because interest rates are quite low. And if if uh, you you know took a bond right now, you're not going to get more than a percent or two on it. And let's say interest rates start going up. Now all of a sudden they're you know offering new bonds that pay say back up there three or five percent. Nobody wants your bond. So you you really aren't in a good position buying a bond right now when interest rates are so low because when interest rates normalize, when they go a little bit higher, you're going to get clobbered. So that's why I don't have any bonds right now. Um, bonds yield to maturity. Yep. If it's bond sells at par value, it equals the coupon rate. So there's a lot of terminology involved with bonds. Um, but again, I'm not, not a bond person. So the coupon rate is the actual, that 20 grand and the par value is what you paid for it. There won't be too much on the test other than that relationship about interest rates and bonds, because that is important. Bond trading secondary market, certainly. You can buy a bond through a brokerage or whatever. Some people really like bonds. Some people really like municipal bonds, you know, because they're tax-free. But um, it's not as easy as all that. Um, if it's tax-free, it's generally going to pay a lesser interest rate. So there's a little bit more math that needs to be done uh, to find out whether it's worth it or not. You know, a, a taxable bond might pay a 5% interest rate and a tax-free muni might pay 3%. And so you need to know your tax bracket and the rest of that to figure out whether you'd be better off taking the 5% or the uh, 3%. And I'll describe that in another another time. T-bills, T-bonds, treasury bonds. So guaranteed by the federal government, so not a whole lot of risk. Um, so probably even even at today's are probably not you know even gonna uh, keep up with inflation you're treading water but sleek sinking just a little bit munis so that's what i was talking about low risk interest exempt from federal income taxes and federal agency bonds low default risk but the interest is taxable so again, any of these, you know, like for a stadium or something like that, a lot of times you'll see those are big projects. Um, not a lot. Corporate bonds. So corporate bonds, you know, just because they're privately held companies, it's typically going to be a bit higher. You've got this default risk. I mean, municipalities can go bankrupt someplace like Chicago or 
you know, cities like Stockton, Vallejo, other places in California have actually gone bankrupt and, you know, left people with, with nothing who might have had a bond. And then these other bonds, high yield or junk bonds. Um, these are companies that, you know, maybe these bonds may be essentially worthless. They may have a great interest rate associated with them, but you got to be able to collect it. So um, what happened in, in the you know mortgage crisis was they got a bunch of crappy bonds and they put them together and didn't necessarily label it just a bigger piece of crap. They, they thought it was somehow more diversified because not all of them would fail at the same time. And uh, the nature of it was, yeah, they did all fail at the same time. Corporate bond quotation, so coupon rate, maturity, current yield, current volume. You can use the same sort of charting mechanisms that are out there. And so, yeah, I'm not going to go back to, to the graph. But if you, you know, type in the ticker symbol, you know, there'll be, for this perhaps, it might be, you know, ZUG or something like that. Companies come up with that. And if it's not taken, they can they can do it. But anyway... All this information is much more powerful when it's presented in chart form. Um, so this is what I was talking about. If the interest rates raise, the value of your bond decreases. Well, when interest rates are at historical lows right now, that's about all they can do. They, you know, they have hit zero, you know, some of the savings rates. But anyway, they're hovering down at record, record lows. I've refinanced a couple properties, not, you know, for financial trouble, but just to take advantage of the uh, lower interest rate. And it makes a big, big change, you know, just a, a few percentages. I had one mortgage that was, I don't know, about 2100 and dropped to 1400 just based upon an interest rate change. So you need to keep track of that if you've got money out there. Interest rates fall, the value of your bond increases. Well... Like I say, they don't really have any room to fall, so the chance of your bond increasing is very unlikely. Tax implications. So taxed as ordinary income, unless a muni, perhaps. And then if you, you know, bought one of these bonds for twenty grand, you sold for twenty-two grand, you you would have two thousand in a capital gain. Value in a bond. So some of these, you know, equations, formulas that we looked at. And on corporate bonds, yeah, they they have to be, you know, viable companies to keep paying on the bond. If they do fail, you as the individual investor are probably going to get screwed again. Uh, the the big boys will will. You know, the big institutional investors will probably have, you know, superior lawyers, superior representation, and you'll be at the back of the line and may get screwed. Default risk. So just the risk of a company, you know, and that's why the junk bond would pay so much. So there's definitely great inflation when it comes to these things, you know. A bond is not, you know, excellent. Double A, triple A, things like that. Uh, remember I said for, you know, different financial, um, you know, areas, there's there's different rating services, like for insurance companies, it's AM Best. For bond raters, you know, Moody's and Standard and Poor's, um, we'll, we'll do that. And... Um, we'll look at some of those ratings in a second. Yep, risk and reward are very much related. So, like I say, AAA, and you'd think, BB, hey, that doesn't sound bad. Yeah, no, a B is down in the junk range, and you get down here at the bottom, and these companies are probably in default. They're probably not paying anybody already. So it's academic to even think about it, you know, what the yield is because they're probably not paying it. So just keep in mind that 
you know, BB and BA, anything below an A is probably not something you want to be involved in. Unless you're super high compensated and you're very speculative and you think that company's got a way to go. But anyway, I've never really speculated in bonds. I've done it in stocks, but not, not much in bonds. Call, interest rates, talked about that. There's also a, a notion of, um, you know, as long as we're talking about speculation, penny stocks. Penny stocks are, are stocks that aren't traded on the exchange. Uh, if you saw the Wolf of Wall Street, there's a pretty good explanation of that whole system. And it's very prevalent now with the Internet. Um, they have things called pump and dump, you know, and they'll, Oh, I hear there's a great company and you'll see the stock price go from, you know, a penny or two up to, you know, 35 cents. And it looks like, ah, oh, this is going to be huge. And you've already, you know, made a bunch of money. And so you dump a whole bunch of real money in there. And um, that's about when the, the folks who have generated all this hype, which is easy to do, you know, via the Internet, via message boards, via all that stuff, just drop they sell all their shares and and they walk away and the stock price just falls and you know everybody's left holding the bag so if you if you're going to get involved in penny stocks you just you just shouldn't and the canadian stock exchange believe it or not the canadian stock exchange is the is the wild west it's not very well regulated and there's a lot of um financial things that go on up there that especially the mining stocks and stuff that are very speculative. You hear a lot of horror stories. Um, bond investment strategies. Well, let's see what, what I skip over here. Bond maturity. Okay. Yeah. When that bond is going to be, you know, 10 year or 20 year. But again, you can sell in the secondary market beforehand if you want. Uh, interest rate strategy. Yeah. People will put together a portfolio to sort of balance their risk. Um, again, anybody who's advising you to invest in bonds at this particular point is uh, probably not somebody you should be listening to. Maturity matching, so you could set this up, you know, with some sort of life event. You know, you get that $20,000 back um, when the when the child hits college age you could do the same thing with stocks though it's just a different method anyway that's it um we'll we'll talk more about you know stocks and bonds because we're going to talk about mutual funds and and uh i know i kind of got down in the weeds with some of the stocks but it's just kind of important that you have just a surface level knowledge of how those things work so that it's you know doesn't seem just like all smoke and mirrors when you're investing in mutual funds. Because when you when you read a there's a when you want to invest in a mutual fund, which pretty much all of us will do at some point, you know, through some sort of uh, you know program with, with your company, some sort of uh, 401k, some sort of IRA with with whatever firm you work for. Um, if if you do that, unless you're you know private employee but but anyway um you know the uh prospectus is going to lay out kind of the the rules of the road for the fund manager and it's going to explain what sort of techniques that that fund manager can use and so if you're looking for something very conservative in terms of investment and you see you know the fund managers strategy is to make speculative investments using futures contracts and take advantage of options and and you know buying junk bonds and, and you you might see the mismatch there so those when they, when they're employed smartly they can make quite a bit of money and some of these hedge funds and and other things do a lot of these uh, more elaborate financial strategies but um You'll you'll see language like that though in the prospectus and and you want to kind of have an idea of what they're what they're talking about. All right, and uh, 
let me know if you have any concerns and uh, I'll may put out that podcast if you're confused by it. Um, you know, I'll go through it again next week, but it's kind of self-explanatory, I think, because they do a, a fairly good job of explaining uh, uh, the different methods of, of buying stocks in terms of managed accounts and, and buying just index type funds. Till next week.